Oh, hi. Hi. I forgot what we say. Oh, I thought you were talking to me. No. <laughs> well, yeah, that's our right. podcast. I talk to you, you talk to me. Right. We talk to the people together. <laughs> Welcome to Those, Those Two, two chicks. chicks with a podcast. podcast. Yeah, we're here. We're here. I was only fi- like 15 minutes late. You were. I was I was really like impressed. Okay, with your and time. I was literally going to be early, but then I had to go get a coffee. Right. Last minute decisions. I understand. I brought a croissant to her, so that makes up for it. It was really good. Croissant. It was warm. It yeah, those are the best ones. The mm-hmm. Starbies. A chocolate croissant. Chocolate croissant. What's been up with you lately? Um, well, I got jury duty. Jury dury. Jury dury. Yeah. I've been really upset about that. And everyone but I've been telling too, like, I got jury duty. Weren't we talking about on one of our episodes, though, how we would like to sit in on a case once? Yes, so I think this is my time. However, who knows if I'm going to get a good one. Everyone's like, that's really impressive, because I'm 23, yeah. and I got picked. And my mom, <laughs> who, I don't even know how old she is. We don't say that. We don't say that. We don't say she's that. older than 23. Okay? <laughs> I would hope so. My mom's never been picked. And she's like, I don't I think don't, my parents have ever been picked. I don't know. I'm like, my, my dad said he got picked twice, but... I literally don't know anybody... Off the top of my head, and other than you now, who's at jury duty? <laughs> Maybe I'll get a really good case, Dude, or I'll get a super funny case. <laughs> what if it's so good, and we cover it one day? Can you not, though, if you want jury duty? I don't, I don't know the rules. What are the rules of jury duty? Um, I can bring in food and water. Oh, you can? There's a microwave. Also, they Oh, so that, you know some rules. Yeah, but I have to like have a certain number of days, and they have to go in for an interview, mm. and they're asking about all your beliefs and that kind of stuff mm. because they have to see the lawyers have to pick who they want. This, so this is real, like you legit. I got your duty. It's twenty three. Like my I, future can only go so far. So you far told me, but I'm like, oh yeah, she's. It's like real. Like she's going. <laughs> yeah, and like I have to go there, but they said that I can. I'll be there for one day. I'm there until they dismiss me. There is, so I could be there all day. Well, it's only gonna be one day. They said no. Oh. There's a possi- there's a possibility that I could be there for multiple days. <laughs> depending on the case. Yeah, I that's guess. crazy. So it might be really good. Well let's hope so. Because I But yeah. I have to say, I have one complaint. What? So obviously you know me. Yes. Our audience may or may not know me. Yeah. Me in high school. I would cry no. if I got a tardy or a detention or yeah. anything like that. I was a pretty good I kid. was late all the time. See, I was too, but I had great teachers that did not mm-hmm. care. That's why I had to. That's why I had to beat the system. Yes. But anyway, I'm just not that kind of person. I've mm-hmm. never been pulled over. I don't have a speeding ticket. Nothing. Okay. Mm-hmm. I get a letter in the mail. <laughs> Do you know my anxiety? Yeah. How high that was? Yeah. I read. You have been summoned to court. Oh yeah. And I'm like, <laughs> excuse me. <laughs> For what? And then I opened up, and there was like jury duty. I'm like, you need to leave with that. <laughs> you should probably say like. In trouble. Not I just gotta tell you. <laughs> You're summoned to court. Like, that that would it? scare me. I had to pay it's a awful. ticket once and I had to go in like the building in Grand Rapids, mm-hmm. which is like super intimidating because it's huge. Right. And there's metal detectors. Well, there's metal detectors at all of them, but it's sure. like scarier, you know? And I'm like, mm, it's scary. And I don't do well when people raise their voice at me. I instantly <clears throat> cry. So no, or have a weird tone how- with me. We'll see how my anxiety is like. They're gonna yeah. ask me like my name, and I'll start crying. Yeah, I would, <laughs> I dude. Know. I would literally have the nervous poops the whole time I'm there. <laughs> I've already had. What that. is the bathroom rule? How many times can you interrupt? I didn't say that in there. And Maybe say, I listen, should. this makes me nervous. I got a shit. Just whisper you know it to what? the. Instead of them interviewing me questions, I should just interview them with all my yes. questions. Like, where is the nearest bathroom? You should. <laughs> if I'm uncomfortable. Can yeah. tap out? They're going to be like, this <laughs> chick is fucking crazy. I'll never She's make not coming. <laughs> I'll never no. make it. No. I would kind of be really. It's like when you make plans yeah. with somebody and you make it like two weeks in advance and then it comes up. Like you're mm-hmm. kind of excited at the time and then it comes up and they cancel and you're like, oh, fuck, thank God. Like, I didn't want to I did not want to go. <laughs> yeah. I did not want to see you. Hmm. Okay. Well, we talked for a long and time. And speaking of that, mm-hmm. that's how I felt having to see you today oh! because because <laughs> of what we're talking about today oh why is it make you nervous yeah i'm gonna tell you guys this case is brutal like it's not a case it's i won't tell you everything but i also have to say this is gonna be graphic i will warn you when there's going to be a graphic part so you can skip ahead this case is no joke it's gonna be rough 
Do you, you obviously know which case it is, but I don't know if you guys remember. Emma's case from last week was the Robinson murder. And there was a little suspicious man who was one of these suspects. And that is the man I will be talking about today. Dun, 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 dun. So I want to start my story in 1967. Okay. Mary Fleischer. And listen, I don't pronounce names correctly all the time, so I'm sorry, but I'm trying my hardest. Mary Fleischer, a 19-year-old sophomore of Eastern Michigan University, decided to go for a walk on the night of July 9th in 1967. Oh, <laughs> I figured. It's okay. You can cut that out. You can cut that out. Okay. Now, it was late at night, but that day was so incredibly warm and her apartment was just sweltering, so she wanted to get out for a bit to breathe. The problem was that Mary never returned to her apartment that night. Her mother would call the next morning only to have Mary's roommate tell her she had no idea where Mary was. The police were called immediately, but little did they know that Mary would be lying in a farm field for 30 days before being found. And sadly, she would not be the only one. Let's go back in time a little bit, about 20 years to the birth of the man who would later be known as the first co-ed killer. John Norman Collins was born on June 17th, 1947 in Windsor, Ontario to Richard and Loretta Chapman. John was the youngest of three children. He had an older brother and sister, Jerry and Gail, and for reasons that are unclear, Loretta and Richard split, but Loretta remarried shortly after. This marriage was incredibly unhealthy, and honestly might have been a big, might have had a big psychological impact on John as his whole family was abused by this man. Mm -hmm. I will say at this time too, his mother was also heavily drinking. So it was just toxic all the way around. So he was an alcoholic. And once he even used John as a shield to protect himself from another man with a gun. This is when John was only like two years old. Oh. So he, the guy took a toddler and was using him as a shield with, from another man who had a gun. Wow. Yeah. There was another instance where he threw John across the car at his mother. Those are just kind of the big ones. But this marriage obviously needed to end, and it did pretty quickly. And Loretta decided to move back across to the U.S. in Michigan when John was four. She was, a, she was an American citizen. His dad was Canadian. It was here that she remarried to William, William Collins in the family. That's where they got their last name. But William, just like the last two men in John's life, was another violent alcoholic. So this marriage lasted about five years, and by the time John was nine, he had seen a lot of domestic violence, especially violence against women. As John grew up, he seemed to have a somewhat normal academic and social life. He was an honor student, tri-captain of the football team, star pitcher of the baseball team, and a president of a school club. And I can't help but wonder, could his life have turned out really different? You know, he's like, he's, he just seems so normal yeah. at that point. Other than he was extremely angry and sexually aggressive towards women. So he was really popular with girls in his school because people say he was handsome. I looked at pictures of him and he reminds me of like Dandy from American Horror Stories and it just creeps me out. <laughs> No offense. Um, no. <laughs> but everyone thinks he was so handsome. Literally, every witness was like, this handsome man. You see that a lot with, like, uh, what was it? Ted Bundy. Yeah, and I don't... Same thing. Some people, even today, though, are like, like think he's so attractive, and I'm just I like, never got that. Even if he was a normal man, like, it was just like, mm. not for me. I don't know. Mm. <laughs> Maybe I have rude taste. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. John graduated at 18 and enrolled at Eastern Michigan University where he was studying education. He wanted to be a teacher. Things seemed to be going well in the beginning. His grades were good. He had joined a fraternity. He was kicked out on suspicion of stealing. So don't really know what happened in those mm -hmm. years, but as soon as he got kicked out of this fraternity, downhill. Just, yeah. Did it say what he was stealing? Or, no, you know, didn't say. Okay. I have no idea. But it was like petty stuff. Like he did a lot of petty crime okay. in the beginning. It's interesting you said he wanted to be a teacher. And yeah. Just some of his history seems a little odd. Like yeah. I wouldn't I wouldn't think that'd match up like sexually yeah. aggressive towards women. I want to be a teacher. Yeah, I don't know. It's weird. That's what I'm saying. Like I feel like he could have had a chance at such a normal life. And I just think whatever happened to him as a kid, I mean, I'm not a psychologist or anything, no. <laughs> but, you know, I just feel like he could have been a normal guy. And I think it's one of those things that's like nature versus nurture. Yeah. I think it's how he was raised. Yeah. Because you'll see, like, his violence is all towards women and he is like, it's bad. Yeah. So, yeah, it was during his sophomore year at EMU when 
things took a turn for a wor- for the worst. His grades were slipping, he was caught cheating, and he seemed to be committing acts of petty theft just for the thrill of it. And he got in with a few bad characters that just seemed to make his behavior worse. So John was around 20 at this point, and to me this is where he really started to show what his upbringing had done to his mind. So being around so many violent men who would hurt his mother, hurt him and his siblings, it had to have had an impact. And John actually caught his pregnant sister with another man one day. So she was cheating, she was pregnant, and he instantly became just violently angry and beat the man unconscious. And he then turned his attention towards his sister and he beat her until she was bleeding. So she had to be rushed to the hospital. And But while he was beating her, he was calling her names like tramp and whore, other things like that. So it was pretty rough. So now before I tell you more about the victims, I have to state that John has only been convicted of one murder. The rest of these cases were only suspected and he has not been tried for the crimes. And although he's only convicted of one murder, he is suspected of seven and possibly more. Which is just crazy to me. Only convicted for one. Only convicted for one. So. All right. (laughs) Let's go back to August of 1967 when a few teenagers were getting ready to plow a field. They heard car doors slamming. Obviously, this caught their attention. Uh, This area is in uh, (laughs) Ypsilanti, Michigan, which I thought was Ypsilanti for the longest time. I lived in Michigan my entire life except for like two years. And I literally always thought it was Ypsilanti. And so was my whole family. They were like, yeah, it's Ypsilanti. It's fucking Ypsilanti. Yeah. You knew that. I knew that. That makes me so angry. I don't even know if I've ever been there. Me neither. But it's not Yip. What? Just your family? (laughs) Yes! Because then I asked Lucas and he's like, no, it's Ypsilanti. Yeah. And it's not even, the S is before the P. (laughs) It makes me so mad because it's like Ypsilanti. (laughs) I spit. Ypsilanti. The S is before the P. So, English teachers, let me know. (laughs) Just had to stop for a second because it makes me so angry. So this area was in Ypsilanti, Michigan, and it was known to be a lover's lane. And of course, the teenagers were like, ooh, let's go see some action. So they, I, that's just my interpretation. Oh, okay. <laughs> it was lover's lane. I don't know. So <laughs> let's go see some So they're creepers. <laughs> yeah. Well, I listened to an interview with this guy who wrote a book, and he was like, oh, they wanted to see what was going on at the lover's lane. So that was my interpretation. Yeah. You know, so whatever. So... There was a lot of weeds in this area, so they crept up through the weeds, and when they looked, there was another car door slam, and a vehicle just peeled away. They didn't get a good look at the person or the vehicle, but as they were walking away, they started to smell rotting flesh. Mm. Um, They followed the scent, which is such white people shit, but they (laughs) followed the scent until they came upon what they thought was a deer carcass. Which obviously is not in, uncommon in Michigan. It, it was the body was so badly decomposed and had been messed with by animals and insects that they couldn't tell it was a human until they saw an ear with an earring in it. Oh my! God. It was so bad. Um, they ran back to their car, obviously freaked out, and drove to the Michigan State Police where they filed the report. So now, as I said in the beginning, guys, this is where it's going to get a little graphic. He was extremely violent. I'm going to say that again, extremely violent. So if you're uncomfortable with stuff like that, you might want to skip ahead. This was one of the worst sights that longtime detectives had ever seen. So this body had been out for 30 days in the summer. July and August are like the hottest fucking months humid in Michigan. Yeah. So 30 days. Obviously it had been decomposing. Animals had been to it. But it was also so battered by you know, what he had done to her. Right. And the worst part was her feet were missing. And not only were her feet missing, like they had been cut off, they had been smashed off. Oh. I know. By, they think a rock, like some sort of heavy object, he smashed her feet off. Oh. Why? Nobody really knows. I don't know. So it's just kind of weird to me. Like, obviously I don't think he was doing it for like, so they couldn't identify her. I don't know why he did it. They found a shoe near the body that matched the description of what Mary May had been, may have been wearing. And the family did confirm it was hers. And this poor family was just put through the ringer because obviously they, you know, they questioned the people who were the closest to you. But they just really went in hard on mm-hmm. the family. And it was really sad. And eventually they did get their names cleared. But I just like can't even imagine. 
And there was an instance during her funeral where John actually showed up. And obviously they didn't know this Uh was the killer. Sure. But he had asked to take a picture with the corpse. Yeah. To have to go back to the body. Like, he visits the body multiple times. He came to the funeral and asked to take a picture with her. Like, with the casket open. I don't know if it was an open casket funeral. I don't think so. But, you know, he asked to take a picture and they were like, no. (laughs) That's like a strange behavior even... Even just, like, a normal... Yeah. Not, not like, even by murder standpoint. I'm saying, like... Kind of is, though. Right, but, like, you go in there, like, he usually is, like, hey, but we can't get... I know. How bold, though. Yeah, To just be, like, oh, can I take a picture with her? Like, I I think he said he was her friend or something. Mm. No, but no one reported that to the police, I don't think. I didn't see anywhere where they did. Weird. Just weird. Now we're on to our second victim, who was 20-year-old Joan Shell who was abducted on July 1st, 1968. So we're about, you know, a little less than a year apart between these two crimes. Mm -hmm. So Joan actually, I I couldn't find if she worked at EMU or if she was a student. She may have been both because I've heard it in multiple sources that she was either or. Like Mary, she was a student at EMU. Her boyfriend at the time was a man who was AWOL from the military. Because this was Vietnam time, so oh. he was hiding out. He had a fake name. He was hiding out in Ann Arbor. And for people who don't know, Ypsilanti and Ann Arbor are super close together, just a, just a few minutes apart. So we're going to be kind of in that those two areas quite a bit. Just know they're close. So Joan was spending the weekend with her family, and she was trying to cut it short because she wanted to go see her boyfriend, like any other 20-year-old. But it just kind of makes me sad. You know, she was with her family, and she was just trying to get to her boyfriend. Joan went back to her apartment and got a call from her boyfriend saying he would be off around midnight and told her to take a bus to him. And the campus is a straight shot to Ann Arbor, so it wasn't a long ride. But her roommate went with her to wait for the bus because it was like 11 o'clock at night. Her boyfriend was getting off at like midnight. And her roommate just had a bad vibe, didn't want her to be alone. Be that kind of roommate. Seriously. But the bus just flew past them while they were waiting at the stop. So I don't know if the guy was just trying to get off his shift or something, but didn't even stop. And that bothers me so much because she would more than likely be around if that bus would have stopped. You know, it's just like, oh, these cases are always just those one little thing mm, like could have been different. Detail. Ugh, so it just bothers me. But yeah. hitchhiking around this time, especially in a college town, is super normal. Like, all these college kids would just give each other rides. So that's what she decided she was going to do. And her friend was like, please don't. But she did it anyway. So this friend just had bad bad vibes the whole mm-hmm. day. She was picked up with a car that had three men inside and one was John. And she was never seen alive again. But it's thought to be that John dropped his two friends off. And these were the guys that he kind of got in with who were the bad crowd. They were cleared of any wrongdoing, but still a little sus. Like, there's rumors that they probably knew what was happening. Mm. But he took Joan to a country area where he sexually assaulted her and stabbed her over 40 times. Oh, my God. Overkill. Like, just violent, crazy overkill. But most of these stab wounds were in her back. So it's thought to be that she was trying to escape him. That she was trying to run away. He, of course, caught up to her. But Joan's body was discovered five days later in Ann Arbor. So detectives learned from Joan's roommate and the other eyewitnesses that she was last seen with John. Like, they knew it was John. But at the time, he had a good reputation, and the police just accepted his alibi. Are you kidding Nope. Nope. I think this guy was kind of charismatic. Oh. So... We've seen weird. that a lot, though. I know. I think it... I, we need to do a deep dive into, like, the psychology of killers sometimes, but I think yes. that's, like, a big characteristic with... I don't know if it's psychopaths or who it is, but mm-hmm. a lot of them are really char- are charismatic, mm-hmm. which freaks me out because I feel like I'm very charismatic. The time between the murders are now going to start getting shorter and shorter, which is somewhat of a typical pattern for serial killers, but there was another unsolved murder of a co-ed at this time, and I'm not going to go into detail about that one because someone else was convicted, like, years later. So I think it was thought to be that she was murdered by the same person, by John. They didn't know it was John at the time, but her murder was just so different than the others. Like, I think she was, like, shot in the head and just, like, it just didn't match up with his M.O., But because of this murder, that's when people started to get panicky. And that's when the media dubbed him as the co-ed killer, which is probably going to sound familiar to those who really love true crime because it was used 10 years later for Edmund Kemper of California. Ed Kemper. Yeah. Um, So John is known as like co-ed killer or just like, I can't remember what the other one was. 
I don't know, the Michigan murderer or something not very clever. I think, yeah, that was, that was familiar. It was Michigan something like murderer. that, which is like, why'd they give that name to Ed Kemper? Like, why didn't you just leave it for, I don't know, it was weird. And now that somebody else is the one who's really known for it. Yeah. March 25th, a construction worker in Ann Arbor tripped over an object, and he didn't know what it was at first. Mm. It was an arm. And this arm belonged to our next victim, who was 16-year-old Mary Skelton. And she has a really, really sad story. So she was a runaway and ended up with local hippies in the area. And she had a hard time with drugs. And she did what she needed to do to get by. Mm. So I'm going to let you guys use your imagination for that. Because I'm not going to sit here and talk about these horrible things that happened to a ch- literal fucking child. Yeah. Um, but she had to do what she had to do to have a place to sleep. You know, it's just that part is really sad to me. And her body is found in the worst shape of any of the victims. So it's said that she was pretty educated with martial arts. And they think that she tried fighting back and that made him extremely upset. They think she kicked him in the groin and that got him so angry that that's why he was just so brutal to her. And I'm not going to go into detail of how the body was left. You guys can Google it if you want, but Mm -hmm. it's horrible. It is horrible. And the last place she was seen alive was when she was walking on a dirt road where Collins frequently rode his motorcycle. And the police tried really hard to tie this to the hippie community and like the drug community. Like they wasted so much time investigating those people. And obviously it fell apart, but okay. So now we're going to get really close together with these murders. So three weeks after that... On April 15th of 1969, our youngest victim was found. 13-year-old Dawn Basom was found raped, strangled, and please skip ahead if um, you don't like the graphic stuff, guys, but her breasts were cut off. Let me just say, that's not even the worst they found a body. Are you kidding? Nope, nope. But her breasts were cut off. She was only an 8th grader. She was in 8th grade. She was a baby. Mm-hmm. And her body was dumped on the side of a country road and a man found her while driving along in his pickup truck the next morning. So her body was found pretty quickly. Only two months later, so this was kind of a bigger gap, but two months later, U of M student Alice Collum was at a party for a musician. And U of M and Eastern, I think, are pretty close together, right? I don't know. I think I they feel uh, like... he. Anyway, he so he was around this area. U of M's in Ann Arbor. Mm-hmm. So, just so you guys know, I just want you to have kind of an idea of where this guy was yeah, at. Yeah, it makes sense because um, Eastern, sorry. Eastern okay. is in their same. So. Yeah, so they're super so. close. And I think that's why people felt so safe because it was literally all college students. Unfortunately, at this party, she ran into Collins. So, remember, this guy was considered, like, good looking at the time. But he was popular with the ladies. Mm. And so, Alice and Collins were dancing together and started to get a little hot and heavy. So they decided to leave together. Her body was then found at an abandoned barn. And like the other victims, she was sexually assaulted. Her throat was cut. And she was stabbed numerous times. And she also had a gunshot wound to the head. It just is overkill. Like, it just feels like he's... It's And this is kind of fucked up to say, but it's like one thing to kill somebody. But it's another thing to just, like, keep going at their body. Well, he's treating them like it... Like they're his punching bag. Basically. Yeah, it's it's crazy. It's just crazy to me. Yeah. But um, like, cause you hear of like someone using like one of those methods to kill somebody. Think right. about that: throat cut, gunshot to the head, stabbing. Mm-hmm. You, like, who does all those in, in one? I mean, who does all who does any of those in general? But you know what I'm right. saying. No, like, I it's think. like overkill. And it's, like, sickening. But this murder, the police really started looking at Collins because not only was he seen at the party with her, he was seen leaving with her, but apparently they knew each other and had actually went on a date together earlier that afternoon. Oh. He's starting to realize that the police are on his tail. So a few weeks later, Collins ended up renting a camping trailer with his friend, and they drove out to California to lay low for a while because, you know, he was starting to feel the cops breathing down his neck. And they aren't even out there more than a few days before Collins picks up a 17-year-old named Roxy Phillips. Not even a few days. And he had just murdered another girl in Michigan. Yeah. She was decomposed, nude, and a belt was tightly wrapped around her neck when her body was found two weeks later. And the body was found by two little boys who were looking for fossils. Oh my god. Isn't that disgusting? And there were a couple of people who saw Collins and Phillips driving together and it sticks out to them because he was driving erratically. So he was not being very careful at this point. Mm -hmm. And uh, so there were two big things that stuck out to investigators in this case. 
The first was be was where Roxy's body was found. There was a lot of poison oak. And so they decided to look into doctor's records in the area and they found out that John Norman Collins was treated at the same time for poison oak, same time oh. the murder, as the murders. And so then they got his car information actually because they were trying to track where he was. And they got his information from a local car dealership because apparently his car, something happened to his car while he was there and he had to go get it fixed. Mm -hmm. They think it might have to do something with when he was murdering her because remember he was driving erratically. Yeah. And the dealership had all his information, his license plate, the type of vehicle, whatever. So police had his name and him getting treated for the same poison oak as what was found around her body and the description of the car from the dealership that also also matches eyewitnesses' descriptions. Well, Collins and his friend immediately head back to Michigan after that. And California, I don't know if it's just it's just too much money or what, but they've never tried. They have all this information, all this evidence against him, and they've never tried him for the murder. And I will say, too, that the fibers on the belt matched something that was found in his car. I can't remember exactly what it was, but, I mean, they have so much evidence against this guy that it's just crazy. So now we're on our final victim. And police are under extreme scrutiny at this point because there's been four murders in only three months in this one area. So people are getting scared. Police are saying they're doing all they can, but on July 23rd, 1969, the campus police are at Eastern Michigan University receive a missing persons report. Karen Sue Beinman, a 18-year-old student, had failed to appear at dinner in her uh, room after curfew. Karen was only at EMU because instead of taking the summer off to party like most people do after they graduate, she wanted to go immediately to school. Okay. So this was this was July, so it was in the summer. Ypsilanti police reacted immediately and learned that Karen was due to pick up a wig from a downtown wig store where she had been seen heading that way midday. So it turns out that she had accepted a ride to the wig shop with Collins and he waited outside for her while she picked up this wig. So apparently while inside the shop, she said to the shop owner, I've done two things today that I thought I'd never do. One, buy a wig and two, get on a motorcycle with a stranger. And it's just kind of sad. You have to wonder if she didn't know what was going on in the area because most people are on, like, high alert. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I don't know if she was from the area, and she was only 18, so maybe she just didn't know or just didn't think, oh, it's not going to happen to me or whatever. Right. But it's just crazy to me. But the shop owner said the hair on the back of her neck stood up, and she told Karen, there's a serial killer in the area. You know, she said she accepted a ride from a stranger, and the shop owner's instantly like, nope. Yeah. You know, and she tried so hard to get Karen to let her give her a ride. And she was so sweet about it. She was like, honey, please just come with me. I'll give you a ride. You'll be safe. And Karen denied it. I don't know why, but she she actually decided she was going to walk home instead because it was only a few blocks and they couldn't stop her from leaving. What they did do was go outside and get a good look out at the man on the motorcycle. At first, she does get on the motorcycle when she leaves the wig shop and then she gets off and she starts to walk a little bit, but he follows her, talking to her, and yeah. she gets back on. And her body was later found at the bottom of a wooded gully on July 27th. Oh so, it's so sad. It's like, that's the thing. It's just the little thing. Like, if she would have just taken the ride with the wig shop mm -hmm. lady, you know? The police knew that this was their chance to catch the killer. They immediately ordered a news blackout because they had a theory that the killer was returning to where he had dumped the bodies. They think that he was uh, committing sexual acts with the bodies. Oh. And that's why he kept... It's a couple things. I think they thought he was just coming back to take a look. Yeah. And, you know, yeah. They had attempted this blackout twice before when they found bodies, but eager newsmen ruined it. The police ended up putting a mannequin. It's never a mannequin, just so you guys know. Do you know who that's from? Crime Junkie. It's oh. never a mannequin. Yeah. But they put a mannequin at the bottom of the gully where Karen's body was found. And that night it was raining heavily. And unfortunately, this prevented investigators from spotting a man who was running into the gully. They spotted him too late. So he had been, you know, whatever, like looking at the body. Mm -hmm. And uh, they tried to chase him and he got away. And the weather, <laughs> he's smiling like that. I was just like, this is this whole... Isn't that such a shit storm? Yeah. It's so annoying. But And then the weather had jammed their radios. So they couldn't call and be like, hey, mm -hmm. the guy's <laughs> running away, you right, know? Right. But the, luckily the police did have something they could use. Karen's body was found with panties. This is so horrible. But Karen's body was found with panties stuffed inside her mouth. But on the panties was chunks of hair. Yeah. 
and not just not like strands of hair it was literally like clippings from a haircut so mm-hmm. weird. But the police knew they had to use the hair to catch this killer. Yeah. So they had many descriptions of the handsome man on the motorcycle, which did, in fact, lead them to Collins. And they brought Collins in for questioning again, but did not have enough evidence to keep him, even though the wig shop owners who got a good look at uh, the last person seen with Karen had posit- positively identified him as Collins by a picture. So like, oh, they okay. saw him. Right. They gave them a picture to look at. Mm -hmm. And they said, no, that's definitely him. That is the guy I saw. But Mm -hmm. they didn't have enough evidence. They had to let him go. (laughs) No, this is all happening. This is so much, but this has only happened in the span of two years. Like, John is only 22 at this point. Holy crap. I know, he's a fucking kid. Yeah. He's only 22 years old. It's just crazy. But in July of 1969, so this is still the month where he had murdered Karen, he had been looking after the home of his uncle, Police Corporal David Like. While uh, David was vacationing with his wife and family, they returned home on the 29th of July, two days after Karen's body was found, and was annoyed to find a large patch of black spray paint on the floor of his basement. Half an hour later, the phone rang, and it was Sergeant Chris Walters of the Ypsilanti Police, and he wasted no time to tell him, that nephew of yours, he is under investigation for the co-ed murders. Mm -hmm. And it all just, like, just starts clicking in his head. Mm -hmm. Because not only was there the paint in the basement, there was also, like, scuff marks, like he had dragged something. And and the wife, I guess, is, like, a neat freak, and Mm -hmm. she, like, she knows, like, this is weird. Yeah. His uncle was obviously in shock, but he had to look at the huge amount of evidence against his nephew, who his wife and him saw as a son. Like, they were super close. Late that night, he went down to the basement and scraped off some of the paint, and underneath there was a stain that looked like blood. Which, of course, he went to report to the station the next morning, which, good on him. Because I feel like a lot of the time when... You know, it's, it's a someone in the police force and it's someone in their family who's being looked at. They instantly want to protect them. But right. he did the right thing right away. And that had to be hard. Oh, I mean, for sure. saying how close he was. Yeah, he saw, they saw him as a son. He, and he was in shock, but he had to do his job. Right. So he reported it to the station the next morning and lab men arrived later that day to examine the stain. Now, the stain turned out to be varnish. But they were suspicious as to why someone would paint over a varnish stain. So it's kind of like he was just trying to put whatever on the floor like there was something there. Oh, okay. And it was during that time that they actually did find something more interesting. Can you guess what it was? I'm assuming the guy's body? Nope. Oh. Hair clippings. Oh, yeah. Uh-huh. The hair. Because a Collins aunt would cut her children's hair in the basement. That's where the hair came from. Oh. Which is gross to me that like their children's hair was in the mouth of, like, a murder victim. Like, it's just weird. That is odd. But the lab men took a sample and also noted nine stains on the basement floor, which did prove to be human blood. So that afternoon, his uncle and police captain, Walter Stevens, called Collins home and informed him that he was the prime suspect. And after detailing the evidence against him, Collins bursted into, or burst into tears. The police expected a confession, but he quickly regained his composure and denied even knowing Karen. But he was still arrested. So John's trial began on July 2nd, 1970, so about a year later. He was only charged with the murder of Karen Sue Bindman because it was impossible to collect enough evidence to charge him concerning the other cases. And they really only got him because of the hair found in the basement and knowing that he was the only one with access to the house at the time. Mm -hmm. But despite objections from the defense, you know, the jury had swayed and on 19th, the 19th of August, 1970, the jury found him unanimously guilty. So it was kind of, I mean, it was only a month, but they did sway back and forth. Like, can we really charge him on this? Can we not? Because a lot of it is circumstantial. They don't have any of his DNA anywhere. And he was sentenced for, or sentenced to life imprisonment. In prison, <laughs> he was sentenced to life in jail. And uh, he had a minimum of 20 years to be served with hard labor. He is still serving his life sentence up in the UP, despite multiple appeals and even trying to get sent back to Canada because Canada's way more lenient. So I didn't, I've never heard of this guy. No, I and, haven't. Yeah. Us, the last case. Right, and I don't know if a lot of people have because, you know, his, like... 
co-ed killer was taken by Ed Kemper or whatever. Apparently, a person has to be convicted of three murders to be be considered a serial killer. So I think that's why, like, people don't know him as a serial killer because he's only been convicted of one murder. So I feel like this is a guy who really would have been known in, like, the true crime community had he been convicted for... The seven plus. Yeah, but there are um, a lot of good podcasts and novels about him, so I'm going to list some in the show notes. But awesome. that is the horrible story of the first co-ed killer, John Norman Collins. Hmm. Which I, okay, my maiden name is Norman. <laughs> and Lucas was like, are you related to him? <laughs> I was like, I, I hope not. I don't know, because he is in Michigan. Right. Isn't that kind of scary? That is true. I'm pretty sure so. I think someone from my family is from the other side of the state, too. Oh, really? But he might have gotten Norman from a guy in Canada. Mm-hmm. That I think that came from one of his, the first two people who were married to his mom. So, I hope not. Oh. He's ugly. I'm ugly. It could be possible. <laughs> You're charismatic. I am charismatic. Oh, my God. <laughs> wow. Well, I'm going to have to go home and take the DNA test thing. But how old is he now? He is in his late 70s, I'm pretty sure. Let me look it up. Okay. 75. That is odd they haven't, like, looked more into any of the other... I mean, I guess lack of evidence I think it's, like, the money... Sure. ...aspect of it, like, doing another trial. Because he is in jail for a life sentence. Right. But to me, it's, like, just for the sake of those families... To find that closure of... You know who might have done it. Yeah, but but to know for sure and to know that justice has been served against him, even though, yeah, it has, but, you know. So really the real hero of the story is the uncle. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. I mean. Kind of, yeah. Because if the uncle would have said anything, he still would have. They wouldn't have known about the hair clippings in the basement. Right. You know, and that that was the thing where it was like, bam, we got him. But why were there hair, like, I get it, it was in her mouth, but like, why? Why Well, he had to have brought her body there. Oh, down into the basement because okay. there were scuff marks, it was blood, all that stuff. And so I think, I don't know, I think it had something to do with that. He had to have had her there because right. he had to have, like, dragged her. And I wonder if the hair must have got into... Is this the, was Karen the only body that was in the house then? I don't know. He only watched it for, like, a couple of weeks. It was just for a vacation, so probably. Oh, okay. Because well, all the sure, other... Mur- like, that was the only one where he had been at that house. Okay. Staying there. So, mm-hmm. I don't know. But, I want to know, just because I'm nosy. What do you want to know? I just want to know, the the guys that you said, they kind of had a bad reputation, the ones that were in the car. Oh, I okay. want to know how much they know. So I need to, I should have probably done more of a deep dive, but I'm pretty sure the one, so one was his roommate. Okay. Which, like, if you're living with somebody. Yeah. I, I don't know. I've had a few roommate situations. One, I was really close with all of them. Another, they were fucking horrible people. Mm. And I just didn't. Like, there were two girls in the basement, literally never even talked to them once in my entire, like, six months of living there. But I don't think it was like that for him, obviously, if he's going on car rides with the guy. Right. You know? So I think he could have known something, but I don't know if he had a hand in any of it, because it it seems like he's kind of removed. But the other one is the friend, who is one of the people who, you know, was uh, the bad character Mm -hmm. who we became friends with. And he went to California with him. Oh. Pretty sure, don't quote me, but I'm pretty sure that's the friend who went to California. Okay. Um, And I don't think he was charged for anything. So I don't know. It was weird. It was just weird. It just seems odd. Cause you're, you're right. Like, mm-hmm. if you're friends with someone, does not, but that's what I want to know. Like, was he this complete, total yeah. opposite person, just mm-hmm. really nice guy? And whatever? Yeah, I don't think so. I think people knew, like, he was, like had this aggression people at least who knew him more than just like one time meeting him because girl who went on a date with him and then got back with him that night like i think Mm -hmm. she didn't quite know exactly right but yeah i don't know and it's just crazy he was only 22 yeah he murdered seven like well allegedly seven or more people between 20 years old and 22 but still, even if you want what he's convicted for, mm-hmm. he's murdered a person mm-hmm. it's in a horrific up. way. Yeah, like bad. I, I mean, you guys, like, you have to have a strong stomach to look up what he did. Thought about saying it, but I can't. I couldn't even do it. Because, oh, it's bad. Ugh. Even the part, like, the breast cut off was hard for me to say. Just know that yeah. there's worse shit. There's worse shit. I didn't like the rock with the ankles. Oh, oh yeah, that was bad, too. Like, who fucking does that? Why? And why, That's though? so gross. That was his thing. Like, he just wanted to be cruel to people. Yeah. To women. Well, I, I, 
like oh. you said, I think. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I think it's all just circles back to how you're raised. Yes, because you see this a lot with the behavior. That's a good point. And so what I was gonna say is, I didn't do um, a lot of research into this because a lot of this was kind of like allegedly. But apparently, most of these women who were murdered had brown hair, like his mom, ears pierced, like his mom. And just, like, similar builds and stuff. So I think it did have to do with either what he saw. I don't think he had a hatred for his mother because he actually was, like, really close with her during the trial and stuff. And actually, like, I think he he changed his name back to her maiden name, I think, which she changed her name back to. Oh. I think. Okay. That's what I saw from a few sources. But like I said, I didn't research enough into it because I just didn't know. Mm-hmm. And another thing, too, which is really messed up, but most of these girls who were murdered were on their period at the time. So, that, like, he was murdering women on their period. As if we don't have enough to worry about when we're on our period. Right. So, it's weird. Is that just an odd coincidence? Like, this is, or just, is he... Don't know. How would you know? Don't know. There's not enough stuff on this guy. Right. Because he's literally not considered a serial killer based on the circumstantial evidence. He... People don't talk about him. That is weird Mm -hmm. that they're all on their period. Why? There's so much with this case. And I was listening to um, a podcast. I'll look up the guy's name quick because he wrote a book. (laughs) How would you say that name? Gregory A. Forner? I think it's like Fournier. 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 I'll link it. I'll link it, guys, because he has a book that goes. He actually had, he lived on the same block as Collins. And Collins tried picking up his girlfriend once. So he got really into this case, and his book has so much detail about Mm. what happened. Not exactly, like, what happened to them, but, like, like I was saying, the details of, like, what they were doing that night or whatever. He has all those details. Which, it's more like a storytelling verse, like, facts. Like, it's good. It's good. Mm. So, yeah. Interesting. Yeah, sorry guys, that was kind of a bummer. That was an interesting case. It though. was good, right? Like, right. I mean, after especially hearing from him, yeah, they were so in, invested in like mm-hmm. framing that the the Robinson family, you know, a Collins. Yeah, and now hearing his story, I I do not think he was involved whatsoever. Because no. all his murders, like I said, were in Ypsilanti and Ann Arbor, which right. are literally right next to each other. I don't think he went anywhere other than California. Right. Maybe that's but... why they thought it could have been him, but. There was nothing even stating he was in the, you know, northern Michigan. No. no. So it was weird. <laughs> I don't know. All right, guys. Sorry. Uh, hopefully that didn't bum you out too much and you guys enjoyed that. My knees hurt. Your knees hurt? My back hurts. Well, my knees twinge when I hear, print, like, oh! those things. <laughs> like, they can't <laughs> play. <laughs> That's weird. <laughs> it happens when it rains, too. Oh. Just kind of like, Are you sure you're not 80? <laughs> I like to say I'm an old woman, but my knees don't hurt when it's going to Oh my rain. gosh. My I ankles wake, do. Yeah, because when I wake up, like I sound like I'm from like the Exorcist movie. Oh, I was going to snow away. Um, what? I'm, like when I wake up in the morning. What do you do? <laughs> Ew! Like this crack you're crack. back. That's why it sounded really weird on that. <laughs> <laughs> sounded like a duck. I, I do a really good duck. Do you? Like, I do. Okay, I just read at you. <laughs> Well, now there's pressure. Okay. Okay, I won't look. Look, it doesn't sound good. I just think it sounds like Okay. Good. Okay. <laughs> yes, it does! <laughs> oh, that one's good! <laughs> that one's really good! Forget the podcast. No, fuck it, we're doing... <laughs> Mickey Mouse. Sound effects. Hot dog, hot dog, hot dig it a dog. All right, we that should probably end this. Hopefully you guys like this longer episode, just so you know how this thing works, which we really don't really know how this thing works, but Tuesdays are our true crime days. Mm-hmm. Fridays are more of like our fun days. Yes. And it could be anything. Conspiracies, spookies. To get our mind off Human murder. combustion. <laughs> Whatever it could be. So check us out on Fridays if you like something a little more lighthearted. Yeah. Alright, thank you guys. Thank you. Bye. Bye.